Hi, I'm Daniel Smith, the Southwest Regional Agronomist for the Nutrient Pest Management Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. Today I'm going to be talking about practical weed management for low margin years. It's important to manage weeds regardless of crop prices to protect crop yield and not to increase the soil seed bank. Since glyphosate tolerant crops were introduced, weed control practices have changed and become more relaxed. Older chemistries, however, offer great opportunities for low cost options. However, some problems with these older chemistries may exist, such as herbicide injury and agonistic effects that may be occurring out in the field. We should always know our weeds and field histories. We should evaluate and keep detailed records of these practices and use crop rotation. We should have a plan to prevent herbicide resistance, and this includes using post and pre-emergent herbicides at full labeled rates. Multiple modes of action should be contained in these herbicide applications. We should scout prior to herbicide applications, and then two weeks following herbicide applications, we should scout again to identify any misses or potential herbicide resistant concerns. Generic herbicides may help reduce costs and only using the necessary adjuvants may also help improve our bottom line. Preseason planning is very important in weed management. Understanding the weed biology out in the field is important to develop a diversified approach towards weed management and focusing on the weed seed production and reducing the number of weed seeds that are out in the soil seed bank. Using cultural, biological, and chemical control methods are all necessary and selecting herbicides with multiple modes of action. We should know our weeds and field histories. The photo shows Palmer amaranth and water hemp out in the field. This seed is maturing, but it's not mature yet, so we should have a plan to limit seed production out in the field. And this could include mowing those seeds off. At this point, yield loss will be critical out in that field, and it's important to manage this field so we don't increase the seeds that are out in the soil seed bank. The second photo shows mature giant ragweed out in the cornfield uh, where the seed is already viable. So at this point, we may be able to salvage a little bit of yield out of the field, but we want to limit seed from moving around out in the field. We want to manage this field to prevent future giant ragweed problems. Uh, the next slide shows the spread of herbicide resistance out in the field. Uh, the first photo shows a small patch of weeds that uh, turned out to be glyphosate resistance that were, were allowed to mature and produce seeds and then that field was combined. In year two those seeds emerged all the way through the field since they were spread through the combine uh, and again targeted with glyphosate uh, allowed those weeds to survive and produce seeds for a second time. The field was combined again at the end of year two and then the end of year three we had a widespread weed resistance concern and will have future management issues to try and manage that soil seed bank. And these photos are courtesy of The Ohio State University. In-season agronomic practices make a huge difference on how our weed management plan is implemented. We should plant into weed-free fields and keep fields as weed-free as possible. We should always be planting crop seed that is weed-free and scouting regularly. Using multiple modes of action that are effective against the most troublesome weed species out in the field or those that are most prone to be resistant is critical and applying the recommended rates for these weed species based on weed size. We should emphasize cultural practices out in the field such as uh, crop rotation and using mechanical and biological methods are appropriate to control weeds. In the harvest and post-harvest timing, we should avoid weed seed movement by cleaning equipment, investing in a little bit of time to make sure our equipment is free of weed seeds from moving field to field is critical. Harvest fields with resistant concerns or widespread weed issues last. Uh, and preventing field to field and within field movement of weed seed is critical. Managing weed seed at harvest and after harvest prevents the soil seed bank from building up and managing field borders can prevent weeds from moving into the field. The future costs of for poor weed management uh, include hand weeding, failed herbicide attempts, tillage, yield loss, and increased costs to reduce that soil seed bank. And these can be done in several ways. Hand weeding has been utilized in some southern states with a typical cost of $75 per acre. Using herbicide multiple times and not realizing herbicide resistance is occurring costs farmers time and money, and often yield is lost to patches and even complete fields due to the lack of management. Technology developed to prevent the spread of weed seeds is 
present and is, has been developed by an Australian farmer. The seed destructor costs anywhere from $30,000 to $180,000 for the unit alone. And this machine turns the weed seed into a flower and shaft-like material to prevent the weed seed bank from building. This is the herbicide mode of action chart. And once a herbicide is purchased, it's hard to change the mode of action, obviously. So it's important to make a plan to control the weeds on your farm first. So we should identify the weed species that historically has been problematic, and second, consider the herbicide resistance species either on our farm or currently in the area. We should plan to prevent herbicide resistance by selecting herbicide that has multiple modes of action, either as a premix or mixing multiple products together. Always read and follow the herbicide label, and herbicide resistance can occur from selecting the same herbicide over time, creating species that may be less susceptible to control. Herbicide resistance in Wisconsin has, was first seen in 1979 with common lambs quarter resistance to PS2 chemistry through the over-reliance of atrazine. Through the 1990s, we saw ALS and then finally glyphosate resistance concerns in Wisconsin. The following few slides will show us county by county where herbicide resistance is a concern. The first slide details horseweed. Velvet leaf, common ragweed, giant ragweed, water hemp, which is widespread in Wisconsin with quite a few cases of confirmed glyphosate resistance in one county that has glyphosate and PPO confirmed resistance. And finally, Palmer amaranth, which is confirmed to be resistant in two counties in to glyphosate and has HPPD and ALS inhibitor resistance in another. It's important to scout prior to herbicide applications to identify the weeds present and to measure the weed size and stage the crop. It's important to know how big our weeds are so we can target the correct herbicide chemistry towards these weeds and knowing the crop size allows us to make a legal herbicide application because there are restrictions on crop size on herbicide labels. Using a pre-emergent herbicide can help us prevent weeds from emerging and use this product at a full labeled rate so we don't have any weed escapes. Follow the label for recommended application methods, spray volumes, and additives for the most success. Adding a burn down herbicide may be necessary if we have a lot of weed species already on the field and choose the, our pre-emergent herbicide based on our field histories. So this is a sample plan for management of water hemp and palmer amaranth in Wisconsin and soybeans. And there are many good herbicide choices in Wisconsin, and we should always be looking for university data on weed control to make our final selection of our herbicide. And we should select our herbicides based on availability, efficacy, and cost. So our sample pre-emergent herbicide may include a burn down if we need uh, to kill the weeds already out in the field, or a tillage pass can be done. So for this instance, in soybeans, we're going to apply a pre of uh, espintolachlor and metribuzin for two sites of action of 15 and 5. And then we're going to follow up with a post application when the weeds are four inches or less of femesophen and glyphosate for 14 and 9 site of action groups, or lactophen and glyphosate for those same site of action groups, for a total of four different modes of action applied to this field. Generic herbicides may help reduce costs. Glyphosate is a great example of a product where many generic herbicides exist. So in this example, we want to use glyphosate as a spring burndown application, and we want to apply 1.125 pounds acid equivalent of glyphosate per acre. Product A has, is a brand named glyphosate product, and we can apply that at 32 fluid ounces per acre per the label, and this cost is $7.50. Product B is a generic glyphosate and calls for a 36 fluid ounce application rate for a cost of $4.78. The application rate difference is due to a different acid equivalent per gallon of glyphosate formulation, so it's important to read and understand the entire label of the herbicide. For this particular example, we're gonna save $2.72 per acre, and on a 500 acre farm, that would equivalent to $1,360 savings. Adjuvants are necessary in some circumstances for the best herbicide performance. We should always read the herbicide label, and this will indicate what herbicide adjuvants are necessary. And then we should also read the additive label to look for the active ingredients. We should always be researching the products that we're purchasing, and we're not going to be able to fall for snake oil solutions if we do all the proper research on these products. 
Choosing the post-emergent weed control practices based on the weed species present in field histories is critical. The University of Wisconsin publishes publication number A3646, Pest Management in Wisconsin Field Crops is a great guide to learn more information about her herbicide controls. Table 2-3E details post-emergent herbicides for corn. Uh, and there's many of these charts in this book. We'll look at the very first product, 2,4-D, uh, with a mode of action group four and our risk to corn injury of four. 2,4-D will not have any control of grasses, so we move on to broadleafs and it gives a control rating. These ratings are from zero to 10, with zero being the worst control and 10 being the best. We look, there's several weed species listed here, and for example, lamb's quarters has a rating of nine. So that would provide fairly decent control to lamb's quarters out in the field. We should always be looking also for our perennial weed species to see if there's going to be any control of these based on our herbicides. It's important to know our weed life history out in the field. And there's five key pieces to weed life history. The first being when the plants emerge, what is the optimum growth stage for control, and how much seed does one plant produce? How far does the seed travel and how long does the seed persist in the soil? So if we look at common water hemp for the first example, it emerges in that May, mid-May time period and can emerge all the way through August. It will produce 250,000 seeds and has a weed seed persistence of four years or less. If we jump down to common lambs quarters, it will emerge a little bit earlier than water hemp in that mid-April time and all the way through August. We move over though, it's going to produce about 72,500 seeds. However, those seeds can persist for about 20 years. Finally, we look at giant foxtail. The weeds will em emerge in that mid-May time all the way through August, produce about 1,500 seeds, and persist for 20 years or more. It's important to evaluate and keep detailed records of our weed control practices. Uh, this includes photos of our weeds out in the field. Uh, this first photo shows some mature giant ragweed seed, and I could save that photo with my scouting report when I got done. It's also important to keep detailed records of pesticide applications and use those records once you're out there scouting past the herbicide application to see if we had a good match with our herbicide selection to the weed species that we targeted and note any misses that we had out in the field. Small costs now are going to equal future savings. So we want to spend a little bit of money now to prevent those costly options of managing either herbicide resistance or weed escapes. We should know our weeds and our field histories to evaluate and keep detailed records of these weed control practices and always use crop rotation. We should have a plan to prevent herbicide resistance to save money in the future and this plan should be based on field history and weed population. Using a pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicide at full labeled rates is critical as is choosing multiple modes of action. We should always be scouting prior to herbicide applications to select the crop proper control methods and then scout after the herbicide application has occurred several weeks past to identify any misses out in the field. Generic herbicides may be necessary to reduce costs and only use necessary adjuvants. With that, that concludes my presentation on low margins and weed control, and I'd welcome any questions at the following email and phone number.